So let's get into the Q&A and we're gonna get the entire panel together so we can answer all kinds of questions. Uh, we'll be right back with the entire panel. All right, we're back. So if you have questions, please toss them into the Facebook or YouTube chat sections or comment sections. Uh, and if you're on the Vimeo platform on our uh, landing page, just toss them in the chat there and we will try to address everything as it comes through. Um, this is the point where Jeff has to put on his glasses. All right, um, we had a question early on from Brad, which is, is gonna be, uh, I think it's regarding Bebop. Can I install vMix and open remote ports also? A great question. Uh, Bebop uh, is running in Windows, and uh, it, because it's a complete virtualized <clears throat> OS and it's not uh, a web page or Flash, uh, we can run a number of Windows applications, native applications. Uh, what it comes down to is, does that software allow you to run it in a virtualized environment without paying extra or getting a special license. A lot of software vendors require you, if you are gonna virtualize, to uh, pay a little bit extra. Uh, so there's nothing uh, fundamentally that would stop vMix from running. The other point you, the, that was brought up was, can you open ports? And that's on a case-by-case uh, -case basis because Bebop thrives on security, right? We thrive on TPN and MPAA and, and uh, CDSA and, and all the other organizations that, that uh, you know, validate that, that Bebop is secure. And we start opening ports, that leads to, into a security debacle. So it's really on a one-off basis. Perfect, makes sense. Uh, question from Gene. Uh, Brad, you mentioned you had an editor in Toronto on Bebop. What's the connection speed needed to get a similar editing experience to being in front of the machine with minimal latency? That's an excellent question. Um, what we found is uh, the internet connection speed probably plays a lesser factor than the latency does. Um, so, you know, you don't necessarily need a beefy internet connection, but I, I think if you have, you know, and I'm, I'm just sort of ballparking minimums here, if you have 40 to 50 download and, you know, seven to 10 upload, I think you're in a pretty good sweet spot. I haven't seen anybody with much in the way of performance problems there. Um, I would encourage hardline connecting using a zero client, but I do think that uh, the desktop client over Wi-Fi uh, does certainly serve a purpose, but I think for the optimal experience, uh, that, is, that is what I would suggest. From a latency standpoint, uh, we were having all kinds of mixed uh, readings when we were running some of the uh, you know, available latency measurement speed. So we, we actually stood up a server in our Bebop environment that we could have editors ping. So now when we send them instructions to run a ping test, we can get an exact latency measurement and we have a good feel for what will and won't work. And uh, that's been our sort of benchmarking for that process. Makes sense. And for those who don't understand the difference between the amount of connection speed and latency, Connection speed is the size of the pipe that comes into your house. Latency is how fast the water can get down it. Bigger pipes can get you more water, but it may not be moving as fast as you think it is. So that's where that is. Um, question from Anthony, uh, what MAM sits best? Michael, I think that's probably geared toward you. Sure. The, the uh, this kind of goes hand in hand with the with the last question I answered is that because we're uh, utilizing uh, Windows VM, we can put an Adobe panel in there, right? A lot of MAM manufacturers make panels that you can run in Adobe and extensions so you can access uh, your MAM, whether it's Levels, whether it's Cat DV, uh, EMAM. You know, the list goes on and on. So uh, it I think it tracks more towards what is your current MAM strategy. Are you doing a hybrid where some of it's in the cloud, some of it's on-prem? Are you doing everything in the cloud? So uh, I don't think there's one that is better than another because it all go, uh, goes to how you're using your media and what locations. But what Bebop can do is say, look, as long as you run in Windows, you're 90% of the way there uh, because uh, after that, it's just doing a little trial and error to make sure media is being managed correctly. 
Very cool. Uh, question for the Telestream folks. Can I playback IMF or DCP files over Glim? Yes, this is Eric. Um, absolutely. So you can load up uh, the CPLs within your Glim engine, and that will play your IMF or DCP package. Um, and typically, that's even difficult to play on-prem because those are approaching with, if it's a UHD, about you know 900 megabits a second, and the Glim engine can load it up within a couple seconds, and you can view that remotely. Very cool. Um, and then a question from Malek, and this is a this is a loaded question. Can we specify which cloud service of the three which you use we want used on our account? That's a. Uh, I can answer that, uh, and then unless Brad wants to, uh, but. When we talk about uh, when we go into the different clouds, I think we need to step back from where Bebop is and say what what are you using right now? Let's say you're already using S3 to store content. Great, that means you should use uh, Amazon for Bebop because you can move content between the Bebop storage, which is your uh, EBS GP2 storage, uh, move that uh, between that tier and then your second tier, which is S3. There's no charge for doing that. That's free. Uh, if you already have content in, let's say, Google, and you're then you're running Bebop on Amazon, now you're dealing with egress fees because you're transferring content between the two. So uh, that that's one uh, consideration. Also, we talk about geography. Where are the data centers, right? If Google doesn't have a data center there, but you want to use Google, it's not going to fly because you need lower latency. So then you may have to go with another provider. So there isn't a Here's the best, go with this one. It corresponds to what your cloud storage strategy is uh, and then what data center is located near you. Very cool. Question from Gene. Um, can you explain what a zero client is and what it does? Do you want me to take that? <laughs> um, sure. Sure. Well, if you look at your camera, I have one right here. This is a zero client. When you use a computer, a laptop, desktop, I know, I know all of you are doing this. You've got 60 tabs open in Chrome and you're streaming Pandora and you're wireless while your kids are watching Netflix. Okay, that, that's not good, right? You're clogging up the network. Your local machine has too many things going on in the background and it degrades your real-time performance with that cloud uh, that you're using with, uh, with utilizing Bebop. With a zero client, you don't get any of that malarkey. Uh, reason being is because the only job this box has in life is to connect to a virtual machine somewhere. So there is no OS. There is no Pandora with 60 tabs. There is no streaming from Spotify. And even better, there's no wireless. It's all wired. So a zero client allows you to connect to Bebop uh, without any of the underpinnings of a, a bloated OS. It eliminates all the latency that your OS is causing. Plus, it's the ultimate in security. Because there's no OS, you can't upload or download from this. And best yet, uh, they're under $300. So you can buy a fleet of these, which is a lot of what a lot of our clients do, and just send this and a couple monitors out to an editor and say, here, go. And you don't have to monkey with their router. You don't have to monkey with software. You just use this. So it's really the, the best uh, experience. And one of the other things that we've also run into with a few clients is they know that there could be problems with someone's router at their home. So they will put a router in the DMZ that completely segregates the zero client environment from everybody else. You can't even ping it on the network. So uh, a good way of, of, of thinking about that is if any IT person has set up uh, a voice over IP network uh, at your office, it's the same concept as that. You, you segregate all that uh, data for Bebop and the zero client off to its own network so you're not running into interference issues with data transfer and, and other people using the network. So set it up as a voice over IP, uh, much like you would do that. Uh, set QoS for the uh, right protocol and port, and you're good to go. Very cool. Um, interesting question from Pablo. When speaking about lower latency, what is considered as what is considered low for proper editing. Now, I, my my take on that would be um, single millisecond latency, or sub sub uh, basically single digit uh, latency. Uh, what what have you, what has everyone else's experience been with that? You want me to take that? Sure. <laughs> okay. I don't want to monopolize. Uh, 
So uh, latency. Uh, I'm a tech guy. I like numbers, but I think people tend to put too much emphasis on the latency number because if we take a look at all the things that give you latency, your keyboard, your mouse, your monitor, your internet connection, the latency of the uh, VM in the data center, uh, adding additional routers, all of that is cumulative. In fact, your local machine, the machine that you're watching me talk on right now, your editing system is probably over 100 milliseconds of latency already. Now, we don't perceive that because we can't grok that kind of, uh, uh, that ki uh, that kind of low latency. It it's instantaneous. So what we normally find is if the collective latency is under about 300 milliseconds, give or take, uh, you're fine. Uh, if you do some research, you'll find that most humans perceive uh, things under two tenths of a second being instantaneous. The average human response time is 210 milliseconds. So if we take all those numbers, uh, what we normally find is where we stand up bebop, if that's within 60, maybe 70 milliseconds, you're going to have no issue. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, Brad had mentioned editor in Toronto. I know that we have folks on the East Coast using West Coast bebop data centers, and that's over 80 milliseconds. Uh, so we like to stay under 60 milliseconds, uh, and uh, that usually gives you the experience that you need. So also... For multicam editing on premises, general rule of thumb has always been below 60 milliseconds to make people happy. Um, question for um, on Glim: What protection does Glim offer for media files? Can you watermark it? Uh, only use Active Directory to log in? Yes, and yes, you can watermark. You can use Active Directory. You can use HTTPS. You can use certificates. So you can uh, basically have either public facing or private uh, VPN. Very cool. Um, Brad, I think this one actually would be perfect for you. Paul is asking, with so much time and resources going into cloud-based remote working, will this method of work be considered even after the pandemic has settled down? Uh, I would say yes. And I'd say one of the main reasons for us is that we're, we're in a kind of a unique situation of building out a brand new facility, a broadcast facility uh, here in Los Angeles, which uh, will go live next year. And it gives us the opportunity now to determine if our facility should be a fully on-prem operation or if we want to create more of a hybrid approach. And I think uh, that is a huge part of the thought process as we go forward. And the timing for us is, is in some ways good because uh, we can make those decisions and our experience of what we've been doing for the past five months and what the rest of this year and in the next year is going to be, I think is going to drive those decisions where we end up in terms of a hybrid model, still a little TBD, but I think it's definitely here to stay in some respects. Awesome. Anyone else want to jump in on that Pandora's box question? Once we've opened it, is everyone going back? I think we're seeing pretty consistent messaging from customers that uh, it, it'll definitely be a new normal and, you know, it, it'll take shape as things move forward. But it's great to have you know, the, the platforms like Bebop to give us that flexibility. Uh, you know, production's hosted there, which I know is a big part of what NFL's got planned as well. And um, it, it's, it's definitely an interesting but exciting path forward. I think going into this, there was a a trust factor that maybe I didn't have about an editor sitting at home for an eight hour day and how productive they would be. And there's a little bit of a lack of oversight, uh, but I've been pleasantly surprised. I think our, our team has worked extremely hard and I almost feel like in some ways they're working uh, more hours and harder than they would if they were in the building. If Jeff, uh, to add a little bit uh, more to that, uh, it, it's funny because we're seeing analytics that people, when they work from home, actually log in earlier, uh, work earlier. Uh, then we see them log off for lunch, and then we see them log off earlier in the afternoon, but a lot of times they come back later. So it's interesting to see these work trends. Uh, to, to echo a little bit of what Brad said, I think when uh, uh, the pandemic hit several months ago, I think a lot of folks were looking for a stopgap. Uh, what can we do to fix this right now? Because it'll all blow over. It'll just go away magically. And I think what people have realized over the past several months is that uh, it's not going away magically. It's not just disappearing. But I think they're also seeing that given the time this this has been out there, that maybe we should be re revisiting the storefront. Maybe we should be revisiting having this building uh, when 
you know, it's going to take forever for this to come back to normal. So maybe we should look at downsizing our physical footprint and keeping people working remote. So I think we've seen kind of a, 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 a move from the stopgap to the this is the new normal. This, this really feels to me like uh, the same thing that happened back uh, at the beginning of the 2010s when the tsunami hit. Um, and suddenly, you know, all of those outliers that were holding on to tape workflows for dear life suddenly realized that they just had to kind of move forward. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really feel that this is something that we're not going back to. All right. Andy is asking, um, do we need to have an RLM uh, license server in the cloud next to the Bebop servers to use various plugins, Red Giant, Boris, Film Impact, and Premiere? And is there a check-in and check-out process <clears throat> for plugins for editors? Great question. Uh, Bebop supports multiple ways of licensing plugins, whether it's node locked uh, or whether it's a flex RLM server, uh, or if you have one that's on-prem, uh, Bebop can open up uh, uh, poke holes through our firewall, so to speak, and reach out and talk to your on-prem license server. Uh, if you don't, if IT doesn't want to do that, then we can spin up a flex server, an RLM server on our end in our virtual LAN that will spit out uh, licenses. The only thing that gets a little bit tricky is node locked because in the cloud, well, while you might always get uh, this be this amount of processors and this GPU, it may be a different serial number. It's still the same model, just a different serial number, and a lot of plugins are uh, authenticated in a node locked way based on the MAC address or a hardware component. So node locked can get a little bit tricky. We have to do some things in the background to, to, to make it almost a reserved instance so you can always get that machine. But uh, we uh, uh, work with several clients who have not only on-prem servers and bot servers as well, not just plugins, um, and we can tap right into those. So that's there. There are multiple ways to tackle that. Very cool. Um, Carlos is asking. He has questions about plugins, but those were answered. Now, uh, do you always access the same machine? Can you upload full res media to it? Fantastic questions. Uh, yes, you're. You uh, when you work with Bebop, uh, we bill on a, uh, a user basis. So how many creatives there are, and we can certainly name the machines: Bob's machine, Jill's machine, no problem. And then every time you go and use it, your settings are there. So that's no problem. That being said, what we normally do is create a golden master, right? An image that has all your apps and everything. So everyone who logs in, no matter what machine they get they're getting all those plugins and all those apps. But uh, we find that uh, users are creatures of habit. So if they were using system number 10, when they log in tomorrow, they're going to use system 10 as well. So uh, again, so that, uh, that completely works. And I love what Brad brought up about uh, high res. Yes, you don't need to edit proxy in the cloud. That's a fallacy. Because remember, your screen that at your desk is just a window into the, v the VM in the cloud. So you don't have to worry about that 4K or 8K payload of streaming that, because you're only streaming the difference in pixels in your program monitor. So yes, we have several clients that are doing 4K, several clients that are doing ProRes 422HQ. We have a lot of folks doing motion graphics in ProRes 4x4. Uh, which obviously is a lot better than animation, but still, that's a tough piece of gristle. And as long as you want to pay for that, that storage in the cloud, and you have enough pipes to upload that, um, yeah, a day in and day out, not a problem. Yep. One that's thing I wanted to add to that as well, if I can, um, is from a troubleshooting perspective, when you're talking about working with high res media, you know, one challenge that I've seen for people not using Debop is in a lot of cases, they're just reliant on whatever Mac, you know, if they have a MacBook Pro at home or they have, you know, an older laptop. You know, the, the really nice thing about this is you're getting consistency of hardware without having to make a huge capital expenditure, you know, and putting that, that heavy iron in people's homes. Um, and I think that's one of the huge benefits is that it is a consistent experience because you can specify the type of hardware being used based on what type of asset you're working with, everything from whether you're working natively with RED or you're just working with ProRes Proxy or anything in between. That, that's one of the things also about the cloud hardware. Some of the configurations that are possible, um, you would never want to even touch if they were on-prem, unless you're doing extremely high-end finishing. Some of this is rip-snorting supercar level machines. Um, the other thing also about the, the what's coming back to your house is it's pixel differential. So the change between this frame and the next frame 
that's the only thing that's sent. It's not the same. It's not the entire image every you know every single frame. So there's not a as heavy a payload as people would expect, and your connecti connectivity back to that cloud really is just command and control, keyboard and mouse. So the the bandwidth levels are not what a lot of people are accustomed to when they think of how they're moving media inside on their internal network. Um, let's see. Um, is the experience on Bebop for After Effects just like you showed with Premiere? Uh, yes, uh, there's a couple uh, notes to that. Uh, because we're not preventing you from using the app, how you wouldn't use it on-prem, yeah, there's, there's no difference. Uh, there are some things to consider. Uh, you know, uh, After Effects is, works really well with machines that have a very high clock speed. It loves clock speed. Uh, when you're in the cloud, you traditionally get uh, more cores than the latest in clock speed. Uh, so uh, the performance, while it's better in the cloud than you would have on-prem, it's not light years better. Uh, and that's you know just uh, with with how it's written. That being said, uh, you can still do dynamic linking. You can still uh, set a render uh, or add things to the render queue in After Effects. You can still use plugins. Nothing is stopped. We don't prevent any of that. So the experience is is still really good. Very cool. And then this is this is one that comes up consistently uh, all over the place. Uh, Malik is asking, can I install and run Wirecast from a cloud server like Bebop? Well, I can answer half of that. Uh, obviously, Wirecast is Telstream, so Telstream uh, has to, uh, uh, I don't want to say sanction, but ensure that their software uh, is able to run in a virtualized environment uh, and uh, and that that's okay. Again, that is something the, the software manufacturer has to uh, uh, sanction. Uh, if, if it's a Windows app, which it, it is, I believe, that's Mac and Windows, right? Yeah. Uh, so we can certainly install it. Uh, we typically find that the that most people want to use the the uh, on-prem box, the 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 gear that seems to work real well for people, as opposed to putting it on Bebop. But we can we can certainly give it a shot. Uh, again, it just comes down to security, and I think it may come down to a pricing discussion. We find that Bebop works better for teams of users rather than just one person. Uh, because there's still a base level of infrastructure that you need. For example, Jeff, uh, you know, if you have 10 editors versus two editors on prem, you still got to get the SAN, right? You still got to get the switch. You still got to get everything in place. And deploying all that for one user may be cost prohibitive, but as soon as you deploy it for one user, you can easily add on another one and the price is very inexpensive. So I think it would come down to more of a pricing discussion of does it make financial sense to run Wirecast in a VM environment for only one person? But yeah. fundamentally, there is no reason we can't run it. So that raises the question of things like Evercast, getting um, you know video out to other folks, other collaborators, as just a straight video feed. And that's a really good question. And you'll probably notice I'm going to speak much slower now, and I'm going to be very careful in, in, in what I'm saying. Uh, we are well aware that people are wanting, uh, we used to call it baseband output, right? HDMI output, SDI output, or maybe even just a full frame rate sync audio and video, low latency, stream. I'm not saying we're going to have something like that soon, but I am saying that it's a great idea and something that we've known about for a long time. So uh, as a complement to our OTS product, which already allows users to see each other's screens and, and talk via audio, I think that high quality video playback uh, and sharing in real time that you would get from Evercast uh, is something that Bebop is working on very, very hard. Sounds like some developers are hard at work somewhere. <laughs> uh, you know, um, it, it, Friday is one of my most favorite days of the week. Reason being is Friday is when our VP of engineering shows new features. And these last couple Fridays have been really fun. In a candy store. Yes. <laughs> um, where I think that's that ex ex extends all the questions. Is, is there anything else that we should throw out there as a softball to either of you? I, I think the, uh, I, to, to go back to productions, uh, obviously, uh, you know, there, there's the team's paradigm and there's the production's paradigm, the productions, you know, it, at its base is for everyone in the same building to work with shared storage and, and, uh, and, the, and the production panel so you can use the same media, same parts at the same time. 
Um, I don't want to uh, uh, glaze over the fact that you can do that in the cloud, right? It, because in the cloud, everyone's on a virtual LAN, a virtual network. So the power of production is to use it not only for a team of users who are landlocked <laughs> in the same four walls, but also to then put that in the cloud and it's still the same group of folks just distributed, it, it blows my mind. And I think once people, uh, uh, grok the fact that you can do that and not have to be within the same four walls it completely changes how you edit and the way that uh, a lot of our common clients that uh, adobe and uh, carl and van and, and bebop have um it's amazing because you just hear the you, you see the light bulb click on and they it's on camera you see it just click over and they realize yeah this is just like editing uh within the same four walls yeah, because you you're in you're in the same four virtual walls up there. I mean, literally, that is it. Your facility is just simply there instead of here, um, and you're just looking through. You're controlling through the window as to what's happening there. Mm -hmm. It's still all actually happening in the cloud. The the elves up in the cloud make it really happen. You're telling them what to do. <laughs> yeah, it's um, the 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 best thing about with productions, especially the uh, the paradigm of how productions works and everything is familiar enough to most people that it doesn't require a huge learning curve to just jump in and use it as well. It just kind of works the way people expect it to. So, um, you know, that's been really, really big on uh, getting it adopted with people. And by adding Bebop to it and pushing it to the cloud, it's, yeah, it just it just does what you expect it to do. Um, we're, we're just about out of time. We've got a slew of other questions. Uh, but we've got some hard outs for folks. So, uh, you know, my apologies to, to Matt Damon. And um, we, we're going to wrap it up. Um, we will try to address these other questions in a, in a, in a different way. Because um, we, we still, this is an important discussion. We want, still want to have it. Uh, thanks to our entire panel for joining us today. Uh, if you've got any questions regarding the, uh, you know, whether cloud's good for your business, whether the tech is good for your business, please don't hesitate to reach out to us here at Key Code Media. We will hook you up with uh, the folks from various entities. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.